even more. Propel us, mobilize us. Lord, light our lamps in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, I want to introduce once again with great joy and great welcome, Brother David Hogan. And it- Y'all doing all right? Me too. Jesus. Okay, let's stand up, please. And let's give a shout for the king that's here. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank y'all. Let's be seated and grab your Bibles, please. You're going to need them. You got to make sure I'm telling the truth. <sighs> Yesterday, Jesus blessed me. My little Catahoula cur dog gave me 10 puppies. And today, my daughter-in-law went into labor for my first grandbaby. (laughs) The devil's in trouble now. (laughs) Jesus, bless her Holy Ghost. Okay. I want to read you a couple of things. Is that all right? I'm sitting there reading my Bible, and I found something in there that's awful important. It's just amazing how you can be reading along, and all of a sudden you run into something that's the most fresh, new, wonderful. Isn't that something? It isn't stale, stinky, old. It's fresh and new every morning. I want to read something to you, if you will. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Not a whole lot of people like to preach out of this chapter because there's not a whole lot of people doing it. But I I would never say or insinuate that I have any caliber close to or even in the same ballpark with this fellow here named Brother Paul. But there's some things that he's gone through that I've been through exactly. And I want to read them to you. You say you're called to ministry. You say you want the name and power of God to run through your lips. You say you want the dead raised. You say you want to reach the world for Jesus. You say you want cancers and tumors to fall off of people. You say you want tuberculosis to run because when you walk in, demons flee from the presence of Jesus in you. That's what you say. But what you do is entirely a different thing. Isn't it? I'm going to share with you today some very serious, to me, important things. Last night I shared a few minutes about it in the main service, and I want to. Because I am confident and the men with me are confident that Jesus' Shekinah presence is going to touch most of us in here this afternoon. We have been fasting daily. We have been seeking the Lord. Our, my wife, the team at the house, their wives. I mean, people, it, it, we're, y'all, we're seeking God for the touch of heaven. For a deeper, more, stro- a stronger experience. Even greater than what we've had. Because it's there. 
So we might as well just go ahead and get it and stop camping out where we are. Because the cloud is moving. We move with the cloud. It's an order from heaven, right? All right. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Jesus. Verse 23 says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Labor's more abundant. Where's this guy getting off being so prideful and arrogant here, you reckon? I can tell you where he gets off. Because religion and useless twits are clouding up the road and not letting people pass that want to do something for God. And it's not arrogance and it's not pride. It's the truth. And it's time to realize this thing is work. It's fun, but it's work. Last night, I worked hard. I was beat up last night. Pushed on, shoved on, torn apart almost. And that's okay. It really is, because it's part of the job. It's job description for me. It was for Brother Paul. He's not here, belly aching, murmuring, and complaining. He's answering, or he's giving a rebuttal to some people that don't understand what he's even talking about. But yet they're going to criticize, belittle, in their pompous castles. The reason I wore my tennis shoes today and my blue jeans today and my little t-shirt is because this is how I go to the Indian houses. Just like this. And I am overdressed when I get there. And um, I th the fellas and I decided to do it because I'm going to talk to you like I would my people. I'm gonna, we're going to pray and seek God together like I would my people. Not like who you are, but like who Jesus wants us to be. His servants, his friend. Okay? Is that fair enough? Okay. There's so many people that just cannot tolerate me. They couldn't Paul. They couldn't John the Baptist. They could not John the Revelator, nor could they Jesus. So I feel like I'm in pretty safe company. It says right here in my Bible, it says, In stripes above measure. I can honestly tell you that in my body I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ for the gospel. These men that are here with me also. The beatings, the stonings, the, uh, it doesn't feel good. Uh, I can't tell you what it's like to be in a village and you're standing preaching the gospel and the Coleman lantern uh, is, is lit and, and the name of Jesus is being exalted and the Indians are there hanging on every word. A lot like you are now. You're finally coming alive up here. And... And, and then rocks start coming through the trees, through the canopy of the jungle, and a little bitty girl that's standing there like this, looking at me. Just a little bitty girl, and I just, I love that. It's the most beautiful picture. She's awesome. And this huge rock comes flying through, wham, and takes her out. And you want me to calm down. Not today. And you pick up that beautiful little darling screaming in pain. Her head is burst open. Blood's flying everywhere. And the reason she's hurt is because of my gospel. You hear that? When people start shedding blood because of the gospel you preach, can you live with that? Or are you going to compromise and back down? What are you going to do? I suggest you listen to what Paul's saying here. Because there's a word of the Lord here we've got, and I'm, we're going to share it. I'm going to share this one and one more. And then I've got a couple other things to share. This is off the paper, these first two. In prisons more frequently. You don't know anything about that. <laughs> we've gone hundreds of times and bailed out pastors, helped 
got lawyers, begged Jesus for mercy, and it doesn't ever stop. They're beaten. We're beaten. We're put in prison. Uh, one of our missionaries was so large, he was real tall, about six, eight, or nine, or something like that. He wouldn't fit in their little jailhouse. So what they did with him is they, they hog-tied him, run a stick through his arms, tied a rope to it, and hung him in the tree all night. You don't understand that kind of a gospel. You live in a different world. You live in a make-believe society. And it's going to come down. Reality check time. Hello? Can you, when that's happening to you, look at your persecutors? They have no mercy for you. Can you look at them and whistle a tune and tell them, Jesus loves you? What's this? I can. Well, you think a lot of yourself. You are wrong. I think a lot of Jesus. And me, I would kill him. And laugh at him. Enjoy it, probably. But in Jesus, you forgive him. Because they're fighting the cross. It's a demon war against heaven. You can't take it personal. It's the devil against Jesus. You always got to go back to there or you're going to make a mistake. It says right here in my Bible, it says, uh, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day. I haven't spent a night and a day in the deep. I've only been out there one day. It says, In journeyings often in perils of water, perils of robbers, perils by mine own countrymen, perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness. <laughs> yeah. You want utopia. You want to say that if I don't always feel like I'm doing good, I'm not doing good. That's bunk. You rarely feel like you're doing good. You do good because the Bible says do good. You do what Jesus said because He is Lord. Not what you feel, think, taste, touch, or see. Okay? Okay. In weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness, I can't tell you, all of these things are miserable. If my flesh hates it, probably more than yours. But my flesh does not dominate, Jesus does. And so we allow Jesus to be in control regardless of the situation. It's a daily decision to let him be Lord. It says right here in my Bible, it says, uh, Besides the, those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily. Uh, we have all these hundreds of churches and all these thousands and thousands of people, and I want them all to make heaven, and it just grates on me all the time. I never escape that pressure, ever. <laughs> Isn't that something? And I'm not trying to be mean or rude to you. I want you to understand what you're asking God to do with you. Some of you can't keep yourself motivated. Some of you cannot see past the own nose on your face. Immature, selfish, inconsiderate, and irresponsible. I bind the devil. We must care for the people Jesus sent us to. How y'all doing? The care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not? 
Who is offended and I burn not? People think these guys were able to live a life. It's a, it's a figment of your own imagination. It's never taught anywhere that I know. Anybody that's worth their salt in the kingdom of God understands that this is the way you're going to live if you're going to preach the gospel. You're offended almost daily and you burn. I, I'll tell you, burn is a good word. I'm a roaring furnace most of the time. Today, four new demons cropped up off the telephone. That, and I mean, roar is a good word. Burn. But your answer is not in offense. What? Let me show you your answer. Can I show you? Watch. Jesus. Because he'll help you. All the amount of taking care of yourself and, and giving excuses and ba standing up for your rights, that's useless rhetoric. It's the Holy Ghost that you need. Okay? Oh, y'all are shouting me down, aren't you? If I have to glory, I want to tell you what things are important. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever and evermore. <laughs> all right, now let's go to Acts chapter 13 since I have got y'all so enthused. <clears throat> we are going for fire, we really are. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. This is God. It's the burden of the Holy Ghost, and I'm not going to talk about it very deeply, but I'm going to read it to you. Okay? It is the will of God today for God to impart to you people. Some of you will receive all kind of gifts and uh, fire and admonishing and blessing and rebuke. And I mean, all kind of things are going to happen today. It says right here in Acts 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and hands laid on, they sent them away. Now, I'm leaving, and we want to pray with y'all. It's a great pleasure and honor for us to do that. I greatly want to see you succeed, but I will not live with you coming to me one day and saying, why didn't you tell me? Because I'm going to tell you, it's right for you to go, but it's right for you to bow to Jesus. Because you leave this environment and things change. It's wonderful here, it is. And, but to me, it's wonderful in the village. To me, it's wonderful, even though it doesn't feel good, it's still wonderful in any situation. Because I know I'm right to be there. You won't take me away from it. You have not the right to do that. And there's not a devil with you that can. And the demon, nor you, can kill me until Jesus says, okay, bring him on to the house. So that makes a guy like me fairly aggressive because I believe it. <laughs> and it puts you out there where all of a sudden you get stoned, you get shipwrecked, you get beat, your own countrymen, your own brother, and everybody. So you, you get thrown into a list where nobody likes to hang out. I do. It's, it feels rough at the time, but it sure feels good at the while. We have a little saying amongst us fellas. Y'all probably won't appreciate it because it's not a hypo-spiritual thing. I do apologize to you that I'm a human. I really do. But one of these days, I'm going to get over that. <laughs> okay. 
Here it is. You ready? No guts, no glory, no newsletter story. <laughs> Jesus. Y'all turn in y'all's Bibles where y'all supposed to be going? It's Esther, I think. Oh, we don't want to go to Esther. We want to go to Daniel. I'm through in Acts. Leave me alone. <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I'm telling you, I can feel the fire of heaven. It feels real good to me. I'm not going to teach this chapter I like to. I'm not going to. I'm going to show you three points. One, Daniel 6. Daniel 6. How could Paul go through all of those things he went through and then live through it to write about it? How could Daniel go through all the things he did and live to write about it? That's important to know this stuff. That's things I think about. Because I think about those lines. They threw him in that den because he would not compromise. Because it didn't matter that there was an edict of the king of the Medes and Persians that cannot be changed by any other law. It didn't matter to him. There was a higher God and a higher power that said, bow to me and worship me. So he said, okay. And when he did, he got thrown into there, that den of lions, and these hungry fellows was going to eat him up and make a small fortune off of, off of the tacos they're selling from him. But what kept him alive? Well, his faith in God. Oh, you cliche bunch of folks try to... Listen, there's something about character and attitudes that we need to get from these people. How could they do those exploits and live to write about it? Yes, God is king. They knew that. That's all true. There's three things right here. I want, in my opinion, why? All right. Verse 3. Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because what? He had an excellent spirit. Get one. Get you an excellent spirit. Quit whining. Quit murmuring. Quit complaining. Quit wishing the world would see your neon lights of how great you are and worship Jesus. An excellent spirit is what we need. You will be put in the lion's den. So to get out, we should look at our friend, our brother Daniel, and say, how did he get out of there? Why would God send an angel and shut a physical mouth of a lion that was going to eat him for breakfast? Why? Because, number one, the man had an excellent spirit. There's another thing. Verse um, 4, the president's uh, princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. You've got to watch yourself. Don't you be one of these frivolous, wine-sipping, cigarette-sucking, hussy-hugging devils. You hear me? We're going to have character and excellence of spirit, and they are not going to find anything wrong with us because of the kingdom. Okay? That's what we're going to do. The reason they could not find anything wrong with him concerning the kingdom or his God is because he had an excellent spirit and there was something else found in him. Watch. It says, For as much as he was... That's right. That's two things. You want the lion's mouth shut? Get you an excellent spirit? 
and go dig up you some gold nuggets of faithfulness and hang on to them. <laughs> There's another reason. Go right on through. Now we'll look at 10. It says Daniel knew that the writing was signed. Now he was a very powerful man. He had his contacts and stuff. As soon as he found out that law was in place, he went straight to the house. Look what this says. And on his knees three times a day and prayed, giving thanks before his God, just like he did before it was ever signed. Isn't that something? An excellent spirit, faithfulness. And then after it was all said and done, the hurricane came, the demons were mad and they turned him in, they busted him, and they threw him in. They went to the king, and they threw him in jail, and then they took him, and they were so excited and gloating, and, oh, man, we've won now. Selfishness, pride, jealousy, envy. The Bible says, who is a man that can stand before envy? Let me tell you who the man is. It's a man that has an excellent spirit. God will redeem you. It is a man that has faithfulness in his heart. And there's one other thing. The king comes running to the, to the mouth of that thing, had those boys move that, that uh, big rock everywhere that was in the ground. I've seen pictures of all different kinds you have too. It doesn't matter to me where the rock was. They moved it. The king crows groveling up in there. Daniel, was your God whom you continually serve able to deliver you from the mouth of the lion. Daniel's response was, oh yeah, sure was. You know what his response was? Because, look at verse uh, 22. My God has sent his angels and has shut the lion's mouths and they have not hurt me for as much as before him. Innocence was found in me, and also before you, O king, I have done nothing wrong. There's three things that got him out of the lion's den. What are they? Excellent spirit. What else? Faithfulness. And what else? Innocence. Those three things I would suggest to you as a guy that's been through several different wars against the devil... And, in, and looking forward to more. I would suggest to you to search diligently from heaven to get an excellent spirit, faithfulness, and innocence of heart. Who can stand before God? A man with clean hands. <laughs> yeah. It's very important to be innocent. When they come slapping, pushing, and shoving, drop your defense and call on the king. You hear me? Or else you'll find yourself defending yourself in a battle Jesus didn't orchestrate. Isn't that true? Now we'll go to Esther. Where is Esther? Somebody can tell me. What page was it? In mine, it's 807 where I'm going. Chapter 4. I'm trying to give you a couple of little nuggets. And in Jesus' name, I'm doing an okay job. I don't know what I'm doing. Who knows? We'll see in time. Only time can tell that stuff. I used to work in the oil field. I drill for oil and gas all the time. Out in the Gulf, all over the South, up in up in the northern states, Alaska, all over the place. And there was this little machine we had in there that said it was a geograph machine. Checked on what was doing. It, it had a little slogan on there. It says, "Time will tell," and it will. I've heard y'all say lots of fascinating things, but I'm such an old warlord. He'll stand there and look at you, smile at you, because I want to see. I'm not impressed with a jump and a shout. I'm impressed with it 20 years from now. That's when it impresses me. I'm glad you're happy, but I want to see you happy in 20 years. Casting out devils and 
been through all this stuff I'm telling you about, and you can come and you can pat me on the back and say, he was right. And I look back at you and say, I know. <laughs> Esther chapter 4. Now I'm going to start telling you a story that I shared a little bit last night. It's very valuable to me. I will not explain. I don't have an explanation. It's, I'm not an explainer anyway. I'm just a reporter of the kingdom of God. But something happened to us back in 1995 on October the 27th <clears throat> that I can honestly tell you I lived an entire lifetime to, to see one minute of the glory of the Shekinah presence of heaven. I had no idea what was available. I thought I did. You should feel what it feels like to touch a dead person and watch them get up. The feeling that comes over you, there's no matching it. You just... Uh, wow. It's pretty exciting. To watch a person been paralyzed for 15 years, legs turn around and move, stand up. To watch somebody 12 years, to watch tumors fall off. Prayed for a lady in one of our villages... Uh, that was, uh, they come got me before daylight and banging on my window. I just got in the bed at two o'clock. And so you, you think it won't ministry? Well, it's a 24 hour day thing. You don't, you don't punch a clock. I had several missionaries come down. They were disoriented and disillusioned. They figured they could come in there with a little card, punch it in, get the eight hour day, and go home. Don't bother me with that nonsense. That's foolish. Most weeks we get our 40 hours in the first two days. I'm not joking. Not all the time, but sometimes. Quite often, actually. They came, got me. I was just got in the bed at 2 o'clock here at 4.30 in the morning. They're banging on my house windows. Bang, 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 bang. They, 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 it's not that they don't have respect. It's not that they... They have need. Many, 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 many days go by. There's not even time for a meal. Jesus spoke of that in the New Testament. But that's not what y'all see. All y'all see is gimme, 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 gimme. Little spoiled brats. Give. It's a two-way street. So I can say that smile still, see? So I went, I was pretty hostile because I only slept a few hours. What do you want? You're coming with me right now. I said, no, I'm not. I'm tired, I'm sleepy, I'm hungry, I'm cold now. He said, you're coming and you're coming right now because they told me that if I could get you to touch my mama with your hand, she would be fine. I said, they told you right. Because Jesus is with us. But I ain't going with you. I went back in the house. I said, you're going to wait till daylight. At least give me till 7 o'clock. I got in there. I sat down and laid down on my bed. Bang, 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 bang. Oh, man, what's wrong with these nuts? I get up, walk outside, and I listen to me. You're going to wait. He said, I'm not waiting. My mother's dying. You're coming right now. My flesh was highly disappointed. <sighs> so I said, okay, go in there and get my boots on. Put on my jacket. Go out there. Threw him up in the back of my four-wheel drive. <laughs> Way we went. Got out there. was quiet. wasn't quite daylight yet. Just coming. A couple of hours out. Went, went up in that house. There was people everywhere. There was lots and lots of folks. And there was this grandma laying on the floor with his... She was pregnant. I, I, what in the world? Look, I said, listen, I am not a midwife. I, I said, I don't do this. And that little old grandma pulled her dress up, grabbed my hand, jerked me down to the floor 
and started and laid my hand on her stomach, and it was as hard as this thing right here, just about. It, she said, tumor. The thing was as big as a basketball, bigger, I'd say. It was huge. Looked like she was nine months pregnant. She was seriously in pain, and, and I took my hand off of her, and I said, I'm not praying for her. And they all go, well, they told it. I said, I know what they told you, but let me tell you what I say. Either all of you get born again or mama dies. That's the way it's going to be. And you say, well, you inconsiderate, insensitive. Well, you inexperienced, shut up. (laughs) Judgmental, leave me alone. He just wasn't out there to show me what was right. (laughs) Maybe we can change that, huh? But when you get there, I'll still tell you to shut up and listen and watch. And do it very aggressively. But, you know, try to be sensitive to your American way, but not very. And uh, so it was pretty good. They all knelt down right quick, said, here's what they said. Ready? What must we do to be saved? I said, now that I can deal with. I ripped my Bible out and started show They'd never heard the gospel ever in their life. So we shared, shared probably, I don't know, 20 minutes with them. One was over there in serious pain, just hurt and hurt and hurt. They all got born again. I went through and prayed for every one of them. Then I told Grandma, I said, okay, now we're going to pray for you. I read some scriptures about healing and all that and prayed for her in the name of Jesus and Ask God to heal her completely by the blood and stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she stayed the same. So they took me into the kitchen, fed me some. This is going to get you controversial. Good. You'll have to deal with this. It's good. They fed me, fed me some blood moly. Blood is prohibited. What is more important at that moment? Can somebody tell me? Is it more important to be exactly perfect and refuse the meal, or is it more important to eat that one blood of blood, one bowl of blood moly and keep the whole bunch of them saved? What's more important? I can I can aggressively assure you. God is not mad at me for eating that one bo- one bowl of blood moly. It's more important for me not to offend one of the least of these. Because that's a thing you will come in contact with, I promise. And so I gobbled it down like it was ham and eggs, but it wasn't. The whole crowd watching me eat. And now we have a strong church there. One bowl of blood moly is worth a church to me. Because in a minute I can teach them that we're not supposed to eat blood. It's the life of the thing. God prohibits that. And so in a minute you're able to show them what the New Testament way is. And so I was able to do that, and now we have a pretty, it's a pretty good sized, nice little church right now. To this day, it's awesome. So what about Grandma? I get up, I walk, I, I excuse myself. She's still in the same pain that she was in when I, when I got there. Nothing has changed except two little points. One, we have aggressively attacked the spiritual atmosphere of the area. Two, all those people are born again now. But I'm still cold, tired, sleepy, and put out. And that's something how that doesn't change, but Jesus, it's just amazing. And you need to know about this stuff. One full day goes by, the 48-hour thing, the, the, the second day in the morning, 
Grandma stands up. Flop! The thing fell out on the ground. And she was completely healed. They called me back. I went back out there. And when I got there, Grandma come walking in with a load of sticks on her back. Like she'd been doing forever how old she was old. Threw it down on the ground. Walked right over to me, knelt down, grabbed my hand and said, watch this. Thank you for your Jesus. Isn't that something? That's the greatest honor I'll ever receive anywhere. Thank you for your Jesus. <laughs> you get honor like you want it. I want Grandma nailed down, holding my hand, saying, Thank you for Jesus. Yahoo. She went in yonder, built a little fire with them sticks, walked out yonder, grabbed one of her chickens, went, 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 way went the head. He gave his life for the gospel. <laughs> she plucked that thing, cooked that thing up for me. The whole time I'm in there, I'm talking to God. I have my Bible out on the little table. That whole bunch of people that's there are just, they, they, they have no Bible knowledge. You can't say as it was in the days of Noah. Who's that fella? You have to start in the beginning and take them to Apocalypse or Revelations. It's wonderful. I like that. That's, that. They ain't nothing like it. They only know what I've taught them. I know they don't know what you taught them because you're not there teaching them. So I don't teach them anything but what we can read in that book right there. There's nothing added. No additives, no dilutants, nothing. Just what we read right here. Isn't that fun? And I'd suggest you doing the same thing. It says right here, let me show you in Esther 4.10. Again, Esther spake to whatever his name is. Say, said, give this commandment to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of king's provinces do know and that whatsoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death. I'm going to tell you that you will be asked by God to go in situations where you know the law will kill you. Whether it was natural law, man-made law, the law will kill you. I've been in rivers raging, being swept down, trying to get across them to go to church. Knowing that naturally the law is, you step in a flooded river that's whitewater oriented, you're going to die. The problem is, Jesus said get in it, so it doesn't matter what that law dictates. I am submitted to a higher law. And it's the law of Jesus the righteous who happens to have control of natural law. Then I go across. I go, I preach, I come back, and the thing's two, three times the size, and you got to go home. So you go home. I've gone in. This is going to impress you. I've got, I've had personally two submarine trucks. <laughs> y'all know what they are? I don't know if y'all have them on the lot up here in the United States. But you never can tell which one's a submarine until you get in there with Jesus. And then they do all right underwater. I don't believe you. Who gives a flip what you think? <laughs> it matters what Jesus says. Seriously, you drive up to that thing, people tell me, this, this gets told to me more than anything else in my life. Brother Hogan, you need to learn how to use wisdom. Okay, let's define what wisdom is. You don't see? 
Let's see here. I think it's Revel or uh, Proverbs. Somebody help me. It says, uh, "He that winneth souls is wise." Now we got wisdom going here. <laughs> so anything outside of that, we're not going to even talk about it. You keep it. It's useless to talk about. So I get to the river and it's flooded and, and I've got I to gotta win souls or I have already been there and I'm coming home. Whichever, it doesn't matter. I'm doing right. I'm a soul winner. So I'm a wise man. The thing's roaring. You look at the people in the truck and you say, how y'all doing? They say, we're doing great. They're already trembling because they know what's coming next. They say, I say to them, you know, uh, there was this fellow named Moses one time in the Bible. And he went up to this body of water. And, you know, there was this army after him and everything. And um, Jesus said to him, get in that river. You know what he did? He got in. But not only did he get in, but everybody that was with him was spared. And they all got across on the other side. I think it was more like a sea, red, I think. And then there was this other fellow. His name was Joshua. He was Moses' student. So you got to know if Moses taught him, there's got to be water involved in his life somehow. <laughs> so Moses, I mean, Joshua was told by the Holy Ghost, get these people across that Jordan River. Well, it happened to be flooded. So he goes over there to the priest, who what had the Ark of the Covenant in their hands. He said, get in that water. Everybody looked at him. He said, right now. So they all walked out in that water. Y'all know what happened, right? Y'all in Bible school, surely you know that. When they walked out in there, the Bible says, the Jordan River went up on heaps and stopped flowing across. And the people went across on dry land. Is that what happened? That's what the Bible says. It matter whether you believe it or not. It doesn't matter to me. It's, that's true. And so <clears throat> I told him, I said, those two fellas, they did that. And I suppose God's still the same fella. So if you want out of the truck, you got about every how long it takes me to put it in low range and first gear and tack it to 3,000. And all of them said, we're going to stay in here with you. And I said, that's a real good idea. We went off into that first river. I, that thing was deep, wide, and mad. Y'all, I had never seen anything like it in my life. I was there mechanically, and I'm muscle man of some mechanic. Mechanically, it is not possible. There's only a certain amount of air caught in the cavity of that hood. And we was under that river a while. We went down in that river. It went up on the hood of the truck, then up on the windows, and it was roaring over the top of us. We did not get washed away. We did not run out of oxygen. And after a while, because I was scared and my foot was stuck to the floor, <laughs> and... Uh, you can't believe how dark it is under a river in a car, truck. It's dark as a cave, I tell you. I turned my lights on. I did. All it did was comfort me a little bit with the lights in the cab with me. But let me tell you what feels good. What well, feels real good to a fellow like me, who's now sweating profusely, <laughs> is to all of a sudden that thing turns up. Wow. <laughs> and you come out and all of a sudden the water starts coming down on the sides of the windows. And then it goes down off the hood. And here's what you say. Thank you. That was a great wash job, Holy Ghost.
wow. <laughs> well, I told you, I, I don't believe that. I told you yesterday. I'm not out of my mind. I'm out of yours. Well, what about being a good steward? Well, what about what about wisdom? Why, why? <sighs> Calmate, chico. <laughs> we'll calm down and go to the Bible for help here. It says right in the Bible. It says, uh, "Where do we want to?" Oh yeah, here we are. I got it. I found us. Verse 12, and they told Mordecai the words of Esther. <clears throat> now look what he told her. Do you know that he's, he's related to this girl and she's the queen and wow and power and politics and woo and good. And look what he tells her. Think not of yourself or with yourself. Listen to me. You got to get out beyond your own selfish motives. We got to get into the kingdom of God. We've got to get into God's will. There's been dozens, probably hundreds of times I've driven up to those rivers and I haven't gone in. But there's been a few times we've gone in and come out the other side. All right? You don't go every, you can't, I can't make a law for you. I, can't, I wish I could. It's, it's not that way. Jesus is Lord, not me. I, I can't make laws and rules for you to govern your decisions by. They have to be on the moment what the Holy Ghost is saying. But you've got to learn how through an excellent spirit, through faithfulness and through innocence, to hear the Holy Ghost. Okay? And not always just worry about yourself. We got to worry about Jesus and what's best for the entire kingdom of God and not just our own selves. Boy, if you'll hear me today, I'm telling you some good stuff. I'm going to tell. Come on, tell them. I'm telling. <laughs> Man. For if you all together hold your peace at this time, then shall. Their enlargement, that word, they have a long definition for it. It just means their escape. Jesus is going to send a deliverer no matter what you do. If you decide, and I'm going to tell you this, I, hey, we may lose another generation because of your dis disappointing decision. Okay? Well, let me just tell you that Jesus is going to send a deliverer to people. If it's not you, it will be somebody. So don't go thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to. Okay? Come on now. It's fun to be excited and raising sand against the devil and shouting and jumping and bucking and snorting and rolling and manifesting. Ooh, ooh, I'll get with you. You saw it. I, I'll go with you. Let's go. But it's funny how many people won't go with me into the real gospel. You like your party, your little river party. That's great river party. Boy, it's fun. But souls are waiting on us. Nations are waiting to be delivered. Okay? If I can say one admonishing thing to y'all about this great revival that y'all and we are participating in, it's don't turn it into another goosebump bless me club thing. Let's turn it into a world global thing and let Jesus come back. Yeah. Because the end of that verse, and then we're going to escalate a little bit. Because I'm going to quit fussing at you finally. Look at the end of that verse. There's a, one of the most valuable statements. I'm telling you, there's nuggets everywhere through that book. It says right in my Bible, it says, um, Who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Wow. That's a pretty serious statement, huh? I mean, chill bumps run all up and down me, all over me. Backers and forwards, up and down. Ooh, that feels, feels right. What if you are chosen 
to change history for a nation. Hey, Brother Hogan, you don't, man, I don't know anybody. I'm not this, I'm not that. Well, <laughs> me neither. I know Jesus. I really do. That's enough. Me by myself, we do nothing. But with Jesus, I'm a majority. No matter what it looks like. And it always looks the opposite. Always does. But just what if? Let's don't look at the bad side, all right? Just what if really you are, we are called? Well, let her go. Let your mind just go with that. What if? Could it be, oh Lord, that you're touching me? You reckon? <laughs> you reckon? Well, I reckon. What if we were born and raised, went through whatever hell you've been through? We've all been through it. But then Jesus brought us around, and He brought us to Himself. And he's training us with great honor and respect and authority and discipline and, and, and excellent of spirit and, and faithfulness and innocence. He's teaching us. Do you know who you are? You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. Oh, you shouldn't have let me find that stuff in the Bible. I found it. And now look. I believe it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really do. Isn't that something? Shoo. <laughs> wow. Here we go. Escalate. 3,000 on the old ticker. Let's go for it. Let's just rack it on up there to the red line and see what, how much horsepower we can kick out. Y'all ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, then. First Chronicles 21. Please, please don't block me now, okay? I have felt great resistance up to this point. Some of you have slowed me down, tried to stop me. It's not my fault that the freight train's moving. You can't stop it. It is not my fault. The only suggestion I can make is load up on the train. Don't get in the way. It'll run right over you. Please open your hearts now. Here we go. Because we went into serious prayer and fasting in January of 95. We did eight months straight, three, two, three, two, all the way through. Fast in three and eat in two. Fast in three and eat in two. Fast in three. Jesus directed us to do that. We did it. And, and we kept our full schedule, too. Uh, uh, we, we did like Jesus said. We would uh, get up in the morning, wash our face, comb our hair, and not appear to men to fast. And we would go out and we would do our thing and we would preach the gospel and go to all these villages, come home, and we would fast straight on through. <sighs> We did that for eight months. We had an agenda. You know what the agenda was? Heaven. We had, every one of us had lists after list after list after list of things we wanted to accomplish with Jesus and Him do and visions and things that we need for ministry. All of us have that stuff. But most of you think that's all there is to it. That's, that's what it's all about. That's only the material side. I want to fly. I want, because my Bible says that the covenant that I'm in with Jesus is greater than the covenant Moses brought. And the Bible says, I think it's Exodus 35, I think, that the people of God were afraid of Moses because his face was shining like a light bulb. 
Well, if that's all true, and I know those scriptures to be there, where are the light bulbs? Where are the shining faces that's glowing, literally glowing? My face has a time and again lit up, really, like a light bulb. It has. That's been known to happen. But it's not a continu. I want it on. You understand? I want it on. I want it on. So to do that, we got to seek after heaven. We can't wish it, hope it, fuss, murmur, moo, hey, mm, buck, snort. None of that works with God. That only works with your little brat friends. We go to heaven God's way. We figure out in the Bible what he wants and we pursue it diligently his way until he says, hey, look over there. Because I want you to know from the beginning, God answers my prayer. Lots of times there's resistance. Happened to Daniel on a 21-day fast one time. The Bible says in Daniel that the day you prayed, it was sent. But there was this prince that resisted and slowed it down. So did Daniel quit? No, Daniel stayed right there and prayed for 21 days until it was answered. So what we did is we figured that's probably the right thing to do. So we sought the Lord with our entire heart. All of us did. All of us, all of us, all of us. Women, children, everybody. Woo, dogs, cats, everybody. Woo. And so, it's because I found it in the Bible one time, and so we did that. Okay, so, you'd figure after eight months, you'd get so accustomed, and so it would become boring and uh, kind of start losing its uh, glitter. That isn't what happened at all with us. We were so excited at the end of eight months. All of us were so filled with anticipation after eight months of fasting like that. When we started into September, we fasted the whole month of September to close the thing off. Because the number nine is the number of judgment. And we figured we wanted ourselves judged and cleansed and made whole. And so to do that, we sought after God for nine months instead of nine days, instead of nine minutes, instead of nine weeks, instead of nine. We went after the big one. And so we sought the Lord Jesus. I feel it. Thank you. <laughs> Golly. Woo. I appreciate you. Thank you. I am not ashamed of you, and I will speak the truth. Jesus. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, oh, man. So we went into that month fast of September. And I, I put myself, I, I, I separated myself from humanity. I uh, separated myself from my children. I separated myself from my wife. We consented together for the bedroom's sake, sexually. We consented together uh, on the... She was to do a front for me. I was to seek the Lord, period. No contact with any human outside of if Jesus came and decided to talk to me himself. And so I'm up in this little bitty apartment with my little computer and my little bathroom and my little Jesus and, and my little stereo and my little Bible tapes and all the little things that you have when you want to really seek heaven. And so I was going for it. Oh, no, there wasn't any email addresses. No, that's all cut off. You forget that. Don't touch me. Leave me alone. And so, so I'm sitting there, you know, and the first day, I mean, you go and you just, man, it's awesome to praise, to worship the Bible. It's just hour upon hour upon hour. And you get to, that lonely feeling. You get that, uh, you have to be... Uh, that withdrawal from, from your normal life, it, it starts getting you and bothering you and trying to draw you back out into it. And uh, So you've got to go through withdrawals. Not only with food, but from being around people and your family, your wife, I mean, everything. It's, it, and the, so, so you are giving up things that are valuable to me. 
And not only did I do that, but I shaved my head, my goatee, and all that stuff. I'm sitting there before heaven, completely bald, Jesus. And so, the third day, the king came. His name, if you don't know it, is Jesus. He came in there and he touched me. I mean, I melted right down into the carpet. Boom. Several hours go by. I am so touched that I am a blubbering knothead. I don't know what or how serious I am touched because I am not around normal or other humanoids. So I don't know the depth of this thing. I just know that Jesus came and Jesus graced me with his mighty touch. And I didn't even know what it was yet. And I said to myself, wow, this is why I'm here. Now that he's come, I can get out of this thing with just a three-day fast. Yahoo. But then another thought came right in behind there. No, that's not what you've decided to do. We're going to buck a little discipline here, and we're going to stay with it. So as excited as I was to come out and tear the world up with this new fresh touch of heaven, I decided to take a little bit of patience and discipline and self-control and wait on him some more. Because what if he wants to do some more? Wow. So I stayed there day four. It was awesome, but it wasn't like day three, day five, same, six, same. But then day seven, finally got there. I'm laying on that little bitty bed that we had up there, and the Bible tape has been running for 24 hours now, and I'm just sitting there sleeping, and when I wake up, just praying in tongues and listening to the Bible continually. And I'm I'm laying there awake on that bed, just worshiping Jesus and listening to the Scriptures and meditating on the powers of heaven. And from one instant to the next, I am ripped off of that bed and slammed into the wall. It was not a demon, it was the Holy Ghost. Revelation knowledge like I have never known in my life began to unfold in my mind. Things started coming to me that I have wondered for my whole life on. Answers flooded me. I began to melt into the carpet, so I ran, I ran and ran and ran, and I grabbed my desk and I was writing down pages and pages of revelation knowledge from heaven. To this day, I don't have it all studied out yet, but I'm working on it. And so, whoo, man, Jesus, I, this is it. This is the big one. And I said, I've got to go tell my family. But then that thought came running through my brain again. What if they some more out there? And all I got to do is wait on that little bus to come by and pick me up. So I did. And every day was awesome. There was never, I had two touches in a week. There was not not, not any more great, uh, what I would call uh, 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 the manifestation that threw me on the wall or melted me. Every day since then now has been Jesus. It's so easy to feel him anymore. And I was here, I was there for days, 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 days. So on day 18, I think, or 17 or 18, I come out of there and I walked down the stairs into where my family was. And I walked down into there. And the first one to meet me was my wife. And she just flipped down. Because they're all fasting too. And they're seeking heaven. It's a little bit more normal than what I was doing. They had to go on with school. They had to, a lot of things have to happen. And so... She just plopped down and began to weep because all she did was look at me. (laughs) I'm different, though. Oh, yeah, I'm a lot thinner. (laughs) But thin is good. It's okay. And she began to weep and weep and weep and tell me, tell me the whole thing. 
She said, because Jesus has been touching us. Now we want to hear how he touched you. So I went right through the whole family. My little kids come running and hugging and kissing. And, and I'm telling them all about Jesus. And a whole bunch of us get blasted. Bang! By the Holy Ghost. And so we finished out the rest of the days. I started out of the fast on day 20, I think, or 21, something like that. So we... Uh, I began to eat or first take diluted juices and so forth, get myself out of it in the correct manner. It took a few days, about 10 days to get, get back out. And so uh, there you got it. Now, but now I'm around a few people and everybody I get around are just staring at me because Jesus changed me. I'm the same appearance here, but there's something else there. And so I was able to go into around my Indians finally and uh, these guys can tell you we went village after village, conference after conference, uh, talking to pastors and going through sections and 30, 40 people at the time, pastors uh, in these sections. And every time I would get up, open my Bible and say anything about the Holy Ghost, the anointing or the fire of God, it would just blast. Isn't that true, fellas? And so... <clears throat> Finally, we, the day came on October the 25th when we had a big gathering of all of our leaders. And there's something here in, uh, in uh, 1 Chronicles 21. I want to read to you because it happened to us. See, David had made a big mistake, King David. Verse 18 said, you know, the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, and David should go up and set an altar and, uh, to the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So David went up at the, at the saying of Gad, and he spake in the name of the Lord. Now, I've got a couple of things here I need you to know. Ornan was a good man. He was a good guy. He had a couple of boys. They was out there doing their thing, doing, getting, doing their job, threshing their wheat. He was a good man. He turns around, he was at his threshing floor, threshing his wheat. He turns around, and there's an angel standing there with a drawn sword. He fell on his face. And then he jumped and grabbed his boys, who I'm sure they were older. He runs over there behind these barley stacks. So I want to just tell you. The things you're hiding behind are nothing more than a bunch of barley stacks. They're not protection for you. It's foolish to think that you can hide behind a stack of barley when the angel of the Lord has a flaming sword in his hand. Don't do that. Don't hide. Open yourself, make yourself vulnerable to God and fall on His mercy. All He wants to do with you is cleanse you and take you through the holy fire to the world. He loves you. He's not mad at you. He already knows about those trivial, puny little barley stacks you're hiding behind. The only person that's tricked is yourself. Okay? Then he's behind those barley stacks looking around at that angel and he turns the other direction to see his king standing there. Watch what he did now. He stood up and put his back to the angel and walked straight over to King David and bowed and said, What can I do for you, my king? Man, that'll preach for two years right there. He was submissive to authority. He understood what he had to do. Even though death was imminent, he obeyed right. Okay? King David then looks at him and says, I want this threshing floor. Ornan didn't get mad because of all the work he had put in and sweat. Ornan's a good man, I tell you. Ornan said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Not only will I give you this land, but I will give you the oxen that we're using. I will give you the wood of the, of the harnesses. I will give you, I'll build an altar myself. And I'll tell you what I'll do. You can just have it all. Boy, what a heart. A giving, a 
obedient, respectful heart. The man was excellent of spirit. The man was faithful. The man was innocent. That's what the man was. But look what David said. Now look at, let's look at the end of verse 23. Now, verse 22, it says, uh, uh, Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of the threshing floor, and I'll build an altar to the Lord. And, and I want you to look at this. Grant it to me for full price. See, there's a lots of people that still believe that there's a shortcut. There is not one. There is no shortcut to the glory of heaven. It must be given at full price. You have to pay it. Well, I thought Jesus already did. He bought you at full price because he paid the price. Now, for you to go to the nation you're called to, you got to pay. People look at me continually. I want to know what the price is. I look at him and say, ask Jesus. I ain't telling you. Because you won't listen. You don't want to hear about prayer and fasting and continual obedience and, 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 and irregardless of the problems and circumstances, seeking heaven and going day in, day out, 24 hours a day, being in, going, doing, going, doing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's not what you want to hear. You want to hear, well, I'll tell you what, you run right down here at this Burger King, they'll give it your way in five minutes. That's what you want. Go get your burger in five minutes your way. All you're going to get is gas out of it. That's all there is. It will not help you. But if you'll pay full price and stand your ground, regardless of who's trying to tell you there's a shortcut, there isn't one. Look, Ornan said to David, no, take it. Let my Lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. I'll give you the ox to burn it for the burnt offering, the wood, the instruments, and, and the wheat. Listen to this. I give it all. Man, what a heart. Isn't that awesome? That's exactly how I feel right this second, standing in front of you. I give it all. That's fine. Oh, I don't mind, man. David's still standing his ground, though. He said, no, you listen to me, boy. Look what he says. No, but I will verily buy it for full price. Do you understand? He could have taken that and been all right, but that he under, you've got to understand. You have to pay. I can help you get started. I, I mean, the anointing that's in my life is tremendous. Very valuable to everybody. And I don't mind helping. Y'all have noticed that I don't. I'll do my best to hang in there as long as I can. Pray and touch and help and bless and rebuke and help and Jesus. Oh, whew, let's go for it. But all, that's all I can do for you is help. You have to then pick it up and pay full price. Okay? So finally that big day came at that conference, and on the 25th, I mean, Jesus fell on us. I said to myself, wow, this is probably the best service I've ever been in. All of us was drunk. We went home. It was wonderful. The second day, we started at 8 o'clock in the morning and went to midnight. Oh, man, it was wonderful. Everybody preached in their brother. Holy Ghost fell every time somebody would ask him to. It was wonderful. People were coming in in a pastor's conference, running in and getting born again. I mean, how much better can that be? Man. And then on that third, that, uh, third morning, here we go. This is it. Listen to me. None of us knew what full price meant yet. I know now what it means. I haven't got it figured out, but I do know what it means. I do know it's available. I do know that he's listening. And I do know that if you'll do it, irregardless of people and surroundings and places and circumstances, in a minute he'll show up. And you will not be ready for it. You think you understand. You think you've seen a lot. No, we haven't. I have never heard of. The first time he fell on October the 27th, we was in this book called Revival by Winky Prattney. 
Somebody began to hear about me talking about this stuff, gave me that book. So I started looking through it. I found us in there. But I found us through several centuries of revivals. Now we're in there. Woo! It feels good to have paid the full price and to receive the full horn of the anointing of God. Boy, you think a lot of, I think a lot about Jesus. 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 That's what I think a lot about. Now, I'm fixing to tell you something that you're going to have a hard time with. I've worked down there diligently for 22 years. There's not a miracle to us in the human body that has been exempted. We have had it. We... I mean, even out to, from, from God guiding us to places when there's droughts and Him showing us ancient wells and dig right here and they start digging and water falls out of the ground just like it did for Moses when he hit that rock. Man, that's wonderful, huh? And I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking about, man, multiplying food and, and I, limbs growing back and eyes popping in heads and uh, new brains and new hearts and new livers, new kidneys, new spleens. And, I mean, ooh, dead raisins. I mean, man, come on. Why do I want anything else? Because it's out there to be had if I can discipline myself to get it. Okay. But you would have never before the 27th of October been able to tell me I would have laughed you to scorn. You would have never been able to tell me there's anything can pale the dead raising. I'd have laughed at you. I've seen arms broke. Healed in front of us. I've seen open cuts of wounds heal right in front of your eyes. Uh, we had a little baby fall in a ditch. The head was burst open, brains laying on a rock. They left the brains and brought the baby to the church. Laid an open, wounded, he head wound baby with brains gone, some of them, on a bench. Went and got elders of the church and come and pray and say, Brother David taught us. That God inhabits the praise of His people. They begin to praise God one hour, two, three, four. At the end of four hours, that little baby raises up, raised from the dead, grabs his daddy on the britch's leg and says, Daddy, I'm hungry. Can we go home? Yeah! How can it get... Oh, oh, wait, wait. I got no brain damage. Perfectly normal. Brains were still on the rock, but he got some more now. So, so listen to me. How can that be bettered? Or what? how in the world could you even expect to think that there's something greater than that out there? I didn't know how, but I felt there was. And so we were diligent to submit and try to find it. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen because all of a sudden the horn, he, uh, horn of the anointing of God came and it was bigger than before. David said, I paid full price. He did. Look at, look at this. I want you to look at the end of this. Verse 24, it says, uh, I will verily uh, buy it at full price for I will not. Listen to this. Please hear this. Chew this. Swallow this. Become part of this. Let it own you. I will not take that which is yours for the Lord. Don't think that God's going to share His glory and honor with anyone. I can't give you what I've got, but you can get what I've got from Jesus. I can only help you on the road to where it's at. It's up to you to continue and find it. It says in my Bible, uh, uh, no burnt offerings without cost. I'm telling you, the, the mentality up here in most Christians is, hey, Jesus paid it all. Shanda. Give it up, baby. <sighs> oh, you childish immature. Come on. 
All the way through, men have paid. And all the way through, when they pay, God gives it to them. Through millennium after millennium. But there's a country of arrogance called America that thinks that you can get it because you said, give it to me. Come on, we've got to repent of that and we will let, he will give you the fire. And that without measure. It says right here, so David gave to Ornan the money. David built an altar to the Lord, a peace offering, offered burnt offering. And he called upon the Lord. Y'all, that morning at quarter to eight in the morning, we was there. I'm telling you, the, 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 the glory of God was so thick and so crowded, we couldn't move through it hardly. It was, you, I was so stooped over. I just got there in my truck. I'm drenched in sweat. My clothes are early in the morning, completely drenched in sweat from the heat of the glory of God. I'm walking like this, trying to get to where the people are. And get around there, finally, we had a big tarp. It wasn't even a building big enough to contain us. We had a tarp. Get around there. The glory of God's been there for hours already. Go there, and God had spoken to several of us the exact same scriptures, so we're sharing the same scriptures. I'm standing up there. We made a covenant. Y'all don't like to hear this kind of stuff, but uh, you're wrong. You know how I know I'm right? Because you're wrong. That's how I know I'm right. And so I called up the national leaders, uh, the, the, the directors of the work. They're standing right in front of me. And, and, and we made this pact, covenant together for souls, the entire country of Mexico in Jesus' name. For whether it was through martyrdom or whatever we had to pay, we was going to pay full price. And every man to the, to the name said, yes, let's do it, Brother David. And then they asked me, I said, go for it, let's do it. We lifted our hands to heaven just like this. I'm looking up to God like this, praying, grant it to be so, Holy Ghost. And when I look back down, those nine leaders are gone. I jumped to the other side of those guys, and the heaven of heavens run in front of me, slaughtered 500 people. The Shekinah presence of God in the form of a cloud came down and took over. I was standing there in the middle of all these people that were gone now. And I'm looking up to heaven. I got half of a question out. What do you... <laughs> he didn't ask my permission. He got beyond me before I realized it. I couldn't run and catch the glory. I tried. I was running wide open sprinting. It outran me. Whew. Slaughtered everybody. People around there cooking. We have to have, uh, we cook for everybody at these conferences, and there's hundreds of us there. And uh, the people around the back cooking are knocked out. So far, from a quarter till eight in the morning till 12, 30 in the afternoon, we finally started getting back together after we thought it was a few moments and it was hours and hours had gone by. All of those pots back there cooking, you women listen to this, all those pots back there cooking, not one burned bean. <laughs> Boy, you're asking a lot of us to believe that. No, Jesus is. I had nothing to do with those beans. I was knocked out like everybody else. Jesus is over there stirring that pot. We had five open-eyed visions of King Jesus walking through the place. <laughs> One of the, after I was finally back, but my legs weren't working, the top part of me was all right, kind of, but the bottom part was not functioning. I was holding on to a table, quivering. This was hours later, and I'm looking, and there's one of our little pastors standing there. He says, Brother David, he's big, isn't he? I'm looking around. Who? He said, Jesus is standing there. I said, where? He says to me, how did we get in this massive marble palace? I look on the floor, it's still dirt where I'm at. <laughs> I looked up to the roof and it's still grass. 
I look at the walls and it still sticks. I said, describe it to me. He said, it's pure white marble floor. He said, the ceilings are so big. The columns of marble are beautiful, Brother David. Look at them. Didn't he, Brother Jeff? Didn't he? Tell them, man. He said, he's got the list again. I said, what list? <laughs> he said, he's got a list. And he's calling off these names. And he, he said, five. And when that man said five to me, five people flew like you shot them. It was amazing. Brother Jeff and I were there. Other people started trying to gather around. But God didn't let them in. There was this bubble of power. I don't know how he and I got in it. This guy was having this vision and talking, and Jesus talking to Jesus and telling us all about Jesus, describing this great kingdom and all these, all this wonderful palace and all this stuff that's going on. Another guy's laying on the floor, going, "Wow, where'd the smoke come from, brother David? Whoa, whoa man, look at this Shekinah presence of God floating! Oh, look out! Wow!" These other guys were trying to get to us. People was crawling to us. People was halfway up like this, coming to us. They'd get to a certain about a meter out from him. <laughs> Jesus said, uh-uh, nobody else. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be so brazen and courageous and encouraged enough to ask him to do that in the house today. Y'all reckon he can do it, fellas? It says in my Bible, and I'm going to shut up and let Jesus do whatever he wants to. And I do have a pretty good idea what he's fitting to do. And David called upon the Lord, and the Lord God answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of God. Isn't that something? I am exploding with fire in me. I can feel it all over me. I, I really can. Lots of you can also. I know that. I want to ask you very politely at first to listen to me and obey me, please. Nobody gets hurt here. You understand? I would like for you to please, you that really heard me and are serious about what I've been saying and are honest about impartation and fire and saving the world and Kidney Indians. <laughs> They're going to hell, y'all. <laughs> uh, we can stop it. <laughs> we can. <laughs> Please, orderly and calmly, line up down each one of these aisles and in the front and in the back. Please. Please, calmly and orderly. And do not, do not turn your eyes on a man. Please, a single line, please, as best you can. In the back, line up in the back, across the back, two, three rows. Please hear me. There's no reason for any of us to get hurt. There's no reason for you to think that I've got to go to where he's at. I will come to where you are. We will come to where you are. Hallelujah. We're going to stay in the... God's doing something, but we've got like an urgent order from the facilities here. Weber's cars are blocking that entrance to that parking lot over there. To uh, my right, you've got to move those cars. They need to be able to get in there to set up.
So anybody's cars that are there barricading uh, that, that uh, west parking lot, just please move your cars. Folks, you don't need to bunch up. There should Jeez, be an that's... aisle right up the middle in every place. No, no, no. Uh, totally spread fine. out across the Everybody's back, happy. across there. It ain't, it ain't and, uh, hurt a thing. And we'll, we're going to walk with Brother David and just help move things around. Uh, Jesus is here. And everybody's going to get ministry. So just keep spread out. And if we move you around, just, just uh, be obedient. And we're going to move around as a ministry team and, and, uh, and just serve the, serve the Lord and our brother's ministry right now. But please move those cars if you have to. And then come on back in and get prayer. It's just obedience. Is that all? Okay. Not if it isn't going to stop a thing. That's right. This train is running. It ain't going to stop. Do we have people that's going to catch and so forth? Um, yeah, we got these guys right here. All right, come eight, here. Eight men. Come here, fellas. Come. I would like Brother Bob, Brother Steve, Brother Ron, and Brother Philip. Stay together. Go down the left side and up and around. Okay? Take your time. We get out of here, we won't have to, but I want y'all to go that way. Take whoever's going to be with you, that, and, 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 but don't yet. Just a minute. Okay? One word, the fire of heaven. It's going to get them. It's going to heal them. It's going to impart to them. It's gonna, I'm telling you, it's here. Okay? Can we do that? The rest of you guys are going to go with me, all right? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, hold on just a second. I need to talk to the people. We can get those souls. <laughs> we can get those souls. Please do not come after us. Do not stay where you are. We're coming to you. Be calm. We're on our way. Is, is there such a thing as a tape that can be turned on or not? Yeah. Yeah. Preferably something with fire on it. Yeah. Uh, the, the sound man could maybe put on a, a tape with, uh, if we got anything about the fire of God, maybe that tape, he's got fire in his eyes. Okay. All right, listen to me, please. I've been all over the world with this now. Y'all are easy targets. Don't let it miss the mark. It's for souls. It is for your benefit, absolutely. You are a soul. Hallelujah. So am I. Hallelujah. Amen. You need something else? One more thing. Go. Bro. Hallelujah. We had promised some of the staff and the, uh, anybody who's a staff worker for the ministry, come up to the pulpit area right now. That's right. Any, any of our staff, the office administrative staff, help staff, just come right up here, right up to the front. Let just, them get through. Just line them up. Just right up here on the front. We're going to just line up here across the back. You can't any believe how staff. valuable you are to God. Yeah. <laughs> Line up right He's gone the through back. great expense of his own self to get you here now. He's not mad at you, but he is serious about what he's doing. Please hear me, church. Let God arise. I don't want you looking at men. I want you extending your hands and arms and spirit to Jesus. And I do not want you to be weary in well-doing. Seek heaven. Seek heaven. Jesus' name. Burn 
servants, to the captives. Let's pray for these people. Let's pray for these people. Pray for these people. Up here. Pray for them. Get them. Fire! Fire of God! Fire of God come in this building. Yeah. <laughs>